welcome to stat i'm telling you all medical true crime stories and it gets bizarre karen wickiam yeah she used to work in er and now she's sharing the knowledge so let's get involved hey funny and scary at the same time medical mysteries all facts she ain't lying <laughs> so tune in the stat if you dare because crazy things can happen anytime anywhere <laughs> yeah Hello, 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 everybody out there in podcast land. Welcome to STAT, Shocking Traumas and Treatments, and I am your host, Karen Wickiam, not to be confused with Karens, just call me Kay, from beautiful Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Hi, how is everybody doing today? I know I I can't hear the answer back, but I really hope that uh, this episode finds you well and cool and safe. I it's been a while since I put out a last episode because there's been so much craziness going on in the world as you know pandemics and such you know that that little thing and uh you know other little personal things that have kept me from the mic but I am back and going to be putting out more frequent episodes now you're going to hear some noise in the background that sounding noise it's because I have my air conditioning on I cannot turn it off right now it is 34 degrees out, feels like 41, and it's just blistering hot, and I can't even keep up with it uh, in the apartment to stay cool. So sorry about the poor sound quality, but it's just going to be when the, this heat is going. It is hotter than George Asphalt in here right now. Probably the worst accent um, known for Georgia, so I apologize for that. Anyway... I am really kind of sick of this Lacey Spears person, and uh, let's just get this case finished. We last left off with Lacey going to Florida in in December 2013. It was a fairly uneventful trip, but Lacey sent emails to the fellowship stating that Garnet was in PICU, pediatric ICU, and these emails were sent on December 27th. However, Lacey and Garnet flew back to the fellowship two days later. So if he was that sick, he wouldn't be able to hop on a plane. So it makes me think that he actually wasn't in the ICU. Garnet started back to school on January 7, 2014. He appeared to everyone to be perfectly healthy. But Lacey constructed a very different scenario. She was taking him to doctors more frequently with a whole new list of complaints, like temper tantrums, a lack of concentration and focus in school, night terrors, not sleeping, and clingy along with the usual complaints of high fever, not eating, diarrhea, uh, earaches. Dr. Carno, the fellowship doctor, um, examined him and found absolutely nothing wrong. It was found out later that during this time, Lacey's search history on her computer revealed that she was looking up dangers of high sodium levels in children and what happens if a child has a high sodium level in their blood and hypernatremia. On Tuesday, January 14th, Lacey took Garnet to the Good Samaritan Hospital emergency room. While waiting, she told the nurse on duty that Garnet had two seizures in the waiting room. He also had a bad headache, nausea, and diarrhea. She told him that he had celiac disease and that he was a failure to thrive. She also told the nurse that he had seizures in the past due to high sodium levels. When he was examined by the physician on duty, Dr. Elliman, everything appeared to be normal. However, Dr. Elliman was concerned about the seizures and ordered a full workup, CT scan, chest x-ray, and blood work. And everything came back normal, except for a slightly elevated sodium level. Garnet was discharged home. Lacey began to text everyone. She was saying that the doctor did not take Garnet's symptoms seriously and that he continued to have seizures and was getting sicker. She was telling people that his sodium was 189. There is no way. It's, it's laughable that someone... A child could survive that, let alone be at home with that level. Within the next two days, she told friends that Garnet had six seizures and was writhing in pain. They visited the pediatrician, Dr. Latz, and recounted the hospital visit and subsequent symptoms. She told the doctor about her frustration with the hospital, that she wasn't being taken seriously. Dr. Latz did a full examination and he too found nothing wrong with Garnet. I think I know why she was frustrated. She wasn't getting the diagnose that she wanted, the the diagnose that she was setting up to happen. It was almost like a tug of war going on that she would look up an, an, an illness or disease, give 
the symptoms to Garnet, go to the doctor and either he would get some kind of diagnosis and treatment or he would appear normal, which he was. Everything would come back normal and she would be like, I'll show you. I'll show you that he's a sick kid. Um, almost that she was taking offense to the fact that her what she was doing was not being believed it's you know i could be totally off with this but this is what it feels like that it wasn't just the munchausen's to get attention it's like you're also not gonna you're not gonna tell me i'm wrong and that my child is safe i'll show you almost like they're telling saying that she to her it was like she didn't do a good enough job i don't know it's just uh crazy crazy so i could be off with that but it's just this feeling i get uh, so she, she was trying to present Garnet as having some kind of metabolic or kidney disease. And with the mounting frustration, she kept pushing the limits and testing how sick she could get him in order to get the response she wanted. It was like medical hide and seek. Two days later, Garnet was visited by his teacher to see how he was doing. She saw that the little boy was in a lot of distress, holding his head, arching his back and whining while Lacey sat calmly holding him. In the afternoon, she rushed Garnet to the Nyack ER. On the way, she pulled over. <laughs> on the way, she pulled over on the side of the road to take a picture of Garnet in the car in distress, and then posted it on Facebook. At the hospital, Garnet was seen by nurse Janelle Kimber. His hands were trembling, and he appeared to be very anxious. Lacey gave a full medical history along with his most recent symptoms. When Doctor McSherry assessed Garnet, Lacey manically retold his medical history. She told the doctor that, among all the other serious conditions that he had, that he was hospitalized with a sodium level of 200, which we all know wasn't the case. And he didn't believe her. And he obviously didn't find anything wrong with Garnet. However, he did admit Garnet to the hospital to have a full workup for his alleged seizure activity. One of the tests Dr. McSherry ordered was for a video EEG to measure the, his brain waves. And it's an important thing to note that he would be videotaped the whole time because they want to see if there would be or what type of seizure activity he would have, how his body would react, and then compare it to any changes in the EEG. Blood work was drawn at the time and his sodium level was 138 and his chloride was 103. Normal. This was at 445 on Thursday. That evening, Dr. Sanku the primary pediatrician for Garnet checked on him at 8 p.m. and she found him comfortable and happy. Things went well on Saturday and his primary nurse and physicians found him to be happy, bright, well-behaved, with no indication of seizure activity. During this time, Lacey had been taking many pictures of Garnet hooked up to machines. Her posts on Facebook took, told a very different story. Her story was saying that he was very ill, not recovering. It was a foreshadow of things to come. On Sunday, Garnet's condition would really take a grave turn for the worse at the hands of his mother. At 9.30, the doctor that had examined Garnet had reviewed the EEG. No seizure activity had occurred, and Garnet was to be discharged that day. Lacey showed no emotion. She was relaxed and calm. Now, most parents would be elated to hear their child had no clinical indication of a seizure, seizure disorder. I mean, woohoo, great, and be, be so happy, and she just was deadpan. Here's what happened next. At 1025, the camera on the EEG recorded the following. Garnet appeared happy and well, eating a cookie. Lacey took his hand and walked him into the bathroom. After taking him to the bathroom, she came out and walked out of camera range. When she walked back to the bathroom, she had Garnet's connector tube in one hand and a cup in the other. For the next three minutes, they were in the bathroom. It is believed that was when Lacey injected a lethal dose of salt into Garnet's port. When Lacey brought Garnet back to the room and placed him on the bed, he looked weak and scared. He kept rubbing his nose, which is a side effect of high sodium. Lacey went back into the bathroom, and when she came out, she had the cup and the connector tube in her hands. She went over to Garnet and checked his G2 port. Garnet was doubled up in pain, and he was retching, trying to purge the poison that she had just put in his body, he couldn't because of the fundiplication. Lacey waited a little longer before calling for help. The nurse assigned to Garnet answered the call, which she saw horrified her. Garnet was gravely ill, and during the next 15 minutes, he was rolled up into a ball, 
His hands were wrapped around his head and he was screaming in pain. Dr. Sunku rushed into the room, and here's a quote from her. This is what she said. Garnet was holding his stomach and retching. He couldn't vomit because of the Nissan fundification. He was in a lot of pain. He was turning and tossing and he was asking for water, which I felt was strange because if you have that much nausea, you won't be able to drink anything. End of quote. Garnet was given Zofran, an anti-nauseant, and Motrin. An hour later, at 11.30, he started to have explosive diarrhea. That was his body trying to rid itself of the poison. And then an hour after that, he was shaking all over and shivering. They did a spot glucose test, and it was high at 240. A full battery of blood tests were ordered. And at 120, while waiting on the results, Lacey took pictures of this suffering little boy and pasted them on Facebook. With the headline, or with the caption, Please, please send some love. We went from fine to really sick in minutes. Yeah, because it's what you did. I, I often wonder if there's a split in her where she does it and then believes that what just happened wasn't her. I don't know. Maybe I'm giving her too much credit. At 2.30, the blood test came back and the test came back within normal range. His nurse, Nora, checked in on him frequently, and he appeared to be doing well. At 4.19, the camera caught Lacey bringing Garnet back to the bathroom with the cup and the connector in hand. He looked like he was back to his normal self. The camera captured his return back to bed, and he looked lethargic. He laid on the bed motionless, while Lacey roughly pulled his arms up and moved him around and changed his diaper. She crawled into bed with Garnet, waiting for the lethal dose of sodium to take effect. She pressed the emergency button at 4.30, and his nurse, Nora, came back into the room. Garnet was again retching and writhing in extreme pain. When the nurse went to administer the anti-nausea to Garnet, she saw that his G-tube port was open. Over the next hour, Lacey was calm and cool as her son lay dying. During this crisis, Lacey found time to text a friend. At 5.30, Garnet started seizing, and the doctors and nurses rushed into the room and began emergency care. They were unable to control his seizures, and his oxygen levels were dropping. He was intubated and airlifted to Westchester Medical Center, where they could better manage this critically ill child. Lacey kept posting on Facebook. Dr. Nalima Thakur from Westchester Medical was remotely checking his brain activity, and this is what she said, quote, I saw a sign of slowing of waveforms. There was no ongoing seizure activity. However, the brain had a very severe dysfunction. End of quote. Lacey was acting hysterically one minute and then texting and posting calmly the next. Either way, she was not at Garnet's bedside, and she kept demanding that his sodium level be tested. Now, you can find this actual footage on YouTube if you want. Um, it's actually all over the, the internet if you Google it, and it shows you. It's very disturbing, so I'm just letting you know if you want to check it out. Uh, I'm warning you ahead of time that it's disturbing what, what you see. At 7.13, Garnet's sodium was 182 and his chloride was 160. The doctors were shocked. There was actually no explanation for it. Dr. Goldsman, a physician at Westchester, couldn't believe it and he asked for it to be repeated. It came back at 178 sodium and 155 chloride. When Garnet was about to be airlifted to Westchester, Lacey refused to fly with him. She had to be shamed to do it. The medical staff stated that Lacey's behavior was unusual for a mother of a critically ill child. At this point, she showed very little emotion and was busy on her phone. The helicopter arrived at 10 o'clock at Westchester. Garnet was settled into room 2108. Dr. Goldsman assessed him, and he remained intubated and mechanically ventilated. His blood gases were terrible, and his sodium chloride still remained at 178 and 147. When he saw Garnet's G-tube, he immediately was suspicious. This could explain how his sodium was high. Lacey's calm behavior, preoccupation with her phone, her eagerness to recount his medical history, and her ridiculous exaggerations struck the doctor as very strange and inappropriate. Garnet was diagnosed with hypernatremia, unknown cause, and he was on life support. He was comatose. The treatment was to slowly lower Garnet's sodium levels with an infusion of dextrose and potassium over a 48-hour period. If the infusion was given too quickly, it would cause brain swelling and death. He was to be given nothing by mouth or G-tube, and this was especially emphasized to Lacey. 
Lizzie posted a disturbing picture of herself and Garnet in a coma, and in the picture she was smiling. By the next morning, Garnet was improving, and the doctors wanted to remove the breathing tube. Lizzie had a fit and refused to let them, but they removed it anyway. There was no medical reason to keep it in. Dr. Pinto, the physician who was also caring for Garnet, stated, quote, He was awake. He was alert. He was talking. He was following commands. End of quote. He was returning to his old cheerful and talkative self, although he was weak. Lacey's friends back home had put together a fundraiser for Lacey and Garnet, and $1,300 was raised. As Garnet was getting better, Lacey's Facebook posts were presenting a very different picture. Lacey was telling the story of a deathly ill child who wasn't really improving at all. Just after midnight, Dr. Ariel Sherbani did a neurological exam on Garnet, and this is what she said, quote, I didn't see anything that concerned me. It seemed like he was coming along as one would expect, having been sedated with medications, end quote. At 7 a.m. the next day, Dr. Goltzman and Dr. Pinto did their rounds. They were very pleased with Garnet's progress. His sodium chloride was 146 and 114. They assessed Garnet as stable and on the mend. Minutes later, an emergency code was called. It was for Garnet. This is what Dr. Goltzman said, quote, I shot out of that office like a bat out of hell, and I, ran st- and I ran straight into that room. I looked at Garnet, and I looked at the mom, and under the bed I saw an empty bottle of Poland spring water. And the first thing I said to the nurse was, get that bottle. End of quote. Dr. Goldman had, Dr. Goldman had suspicions about Lacey, and he was worried that she had given Garnet water, which would cause brain swelling and could lead to death. The process of treating a child with hypernatremia is very delicate, and any diversion from the protocol could cause irreversible brain damage, coma, and death. Dr. Goldsman had kicked her out of the room, and then Garnet had stopped breathing. This is what he said. I looked into his eyes very quickly, and both were blown and dilated. They weren't reacting to light. He was having a brainstem problem. Dr. Pinto was assisting Dr. Goldsman, and he intubated Garnet. They ordered a STAT CT scan and blood work. After Lacey was kicked out of the room, she went directly onto Facebook, writing, Garnet has stopped breathing. He is back on the vent. Please pray. The CT scan came back at 10.30 and revealed that Garnet was brain dead. He had cerebral edema, swelling so bad that his brain herniated and pushed down into his brainstem because it had nowhere else to go. It was compressed at the center of the brain that controls breathing and blood pressure. Dr. Goldsman spoke with Lacey and her parents. It was 11 a.m. He told them the dire news. Lacey put on quite a show, throwing herself on the ground, crying hysterically. At 11.45, Dr. Goldsman had a meeting with the Director of Child Abuse Pediatric Program, Dr. Jennifer Cantor. He was directed to call the New York State Abuse Hotline. And he did, and he told them that he felt Lacey had poisoned and killed her son. The matter was then referred to the Westchester County District Attorney's Office, and they alerted the Westchester County Police. An EEG was performed in the afternoon, and it showed no brain activity. Dr. Goltzman called in around a dozen specialists from many different specialties. He wanted to make sure that all aspects of his condition were assessed. He also needed someone else to call him brain dead. You need two people for that, two doctors. And so Garnet was determined to be brain dead. Dr. Goltzman told Lacey this. He also informed her that he was calling Child Protective Services. Lacey elicited no emotion to the news. On Tuesday, January 21st, Detective Carfee was assigned to the case. He met with Dr. Cantor at the hospital, and she filled him in on everything that was going on. She told him if they were going to search Lacey's house, he should look for salt. The police department in the district where the fellowship was, or MAPO PD, was also notified by the local Child Protective Services about Lacey's poisoning garnet. They went to investigate and spoke with their neighbor upstairs. The Westchester and Ramampo Police Departments decided to work a joint investigation. Lacey was interviewed by Dr. Carfee, and this is what he reported. Lacey told him about the fictitious Blake. She was very talkative and animated, eager to speak. She lacked emotion considering the circumstances. Lacey's friend from the fellowship, Nellie, was shocked to find out that Lacey was being investigated for murder, as were all the members. Nellie and other Facebook friends were disturbed by the many pictures she had posted showing Garnet lying brain dead in the hospital. Chris Hill, Garnet's father, was notified, and he was devastated. 
He tried to get a hold of Lacey, but she wouldn't return his calls or his, his messages. Lacey's parents, her sister and grandmother, were all at Garnet's side, taking turns in the room, but Lacey spent very little time at his bedside. She was too busy on her phone and making posts. The Romampo Police Department got a search warrant for Lacey's apartment. Detectives Kirk Budnick and Dennis Proctor and Greg Dunn from this department conducted the search. They immediately saw a kangaroo pump with a feeding bag attached. They said there were pictures of owls and stuffed animals of owls everywhere. Lacey would tell people that they were the reincarnations of Blake. In the kitchen, they found something very disturbing. Lacey had made a shrine for Garnet. There was a photograph of him surrounded by candles, medications, and a large box of salt. Detective Dunn said that the scene in the kitchen was surreal. They found another empty feeding bag in the kitchen garbage, and in the cupboard, they found hundreds of bottles of holistic medicines and vitamins. The bedroom was a disaster, which was in stark contrast to the rest of the apartment, which was very tidy. There was an unmade mattress on the floor where they co-slept. The detectives collected the holistic medicines. They also apprehended two open 26-ounce containers of salt and a syringe lying on the couch. One of the biggest mistakes they made was that they did not take the feeding bags or the tubing. They just took a picture of it. From the hospital, Lacey called her friend at the fellowship, Valerie Plochet. She wanted Valerie to do her a favor. Valerie was devastated about Garnet's condition. And I just, uh, I'm going to read a quote about what, uh, from Valerie, what Lacey asked for. Quote, she wanted me to go to her house and get a feeding bag in the middle of her living room and throw it away and not tell anybody. And she sounded very serious. Can you do it now? Can you do it now? I don't want you to tell anybody. End of quote. Valerie was confused and uncomfortable with the request, but she went anyway. When she knocked on the door, the upstairs neighbors answered it. And when Valerie told him what she wanted to do, he advised her against it because the police had searched the apartment. But Valerie did it anyway. She put the feeding bag in a black garbage bag and put it in a closet of her apartment. Valerie felt more and more uncomfortable with what she did. So she told a friend at the fellowship. The friend told her to tell the fellowship director of nursing, Nancy Leopold, right away. Then Leopold called Bob Scherer on the executive council. Meanwhile, Lacey was furiously making phone calls, demanding to know who said that she was going to be arrested by the police. Her friend Una took the brunt of her fury, all the while posting demented, attention-seeking posts about her brain-dead son with captions like, My sweet baby Garnet has been declared brain-dead. That's my boy. I'm not ready to let him go. Over the day, Lacey was interviewed multiple times by the child abuse advocate Dr. Cantor with Detective Carfee present also by Detectives Budnick and Dunn, and they all agreed that Lacey exhibited all the signs of MPB. All three detectives got together later in the afternoon to interview Lacey's parents and friends, and Lacey was trying to manipulate the situation about who could and couldn't be interviewed. Una discussed her knowledge of Garnet and his G2 problems. Her father, Terry, revealed that there was no Blake, and Nellie, although she defended Lacey, was really starting to wonder if Lacey did poison Garnet. Let's get back to Valerie Plochet. Nancy Leopold told Valerie to type up exactly what happened, and she did that. Leopold then asked for the feeding bag. Valerie handed it over, and Nancy took it to the medical lab at the clinic and locked it up. Lacey was interviewed again by the detectives. She continued to display the same strange behavior. She would burst into crocodile tears and then immediately perk up and happily answer questions, with no break in between these emotions. The interview ended with Lacey blaming the hospital for Garnet's death. On Thursday, the Ramapo PD detectives Budnick and Dunn got a call from the fellowship outlining Valerie's admission, and they went and picked up the feeding bag and tubing and interviewed Valerie. Meanwhile, Lacey lawyered up. At 10.18, Garnet was removed from life support, and at 10.20, he was dead. Lacey posted and posted and posted one pathetic, dramatic post after another. The detectives continued to investigate and consult with the doctors. They wanted to make sure that they had to solve a case against Lacey. That evening, they gathered all of Lacey's family, including herself. And during this meeting, she suddenly burst out, if I mix something that killed Garnet, it's not my fault. I didn't murder him. End of quote. The detectives and her family were shocked. They went back to her apartment again and removed the other feeding bag from the kitchen garbage. They sent it to the lab at Westchester Police Department for testing. 
A few hours later, after testing both feeding bags, forensic toxicologist Christopher Cording reported back that both contained very high concentrations of sodium, around or equivalent to like up to 70 packs of the little salts that you could get when you go to a restaurant. Lacey was told to leave the fellowship and she said she felt like, and she said she felt betrayed and started acting like a victim. Lacey called her friend April who had set up the GoFundMe account and asked for the $1,300. But April had already closed the account and refunded everybody when she heard about the allegations. Lacey was furious. April stated that she knew in her heart that Lacey had killed her son. Detective Carfee was investigating all of Lacey's social media accounts and got a subpoena for all of them. On Saturday, an autopsy was performed, and other than the poisoning, Garnet was a completely healthy child. He had no sign of any other underlying conditions. The deputy medical examiner, Dr. Milanovic, determined Garnet's death was a homicide from sodium poisoning. Police went to the Comfort Inn where Lacey was staying and confiscated all of her electronics. It took the detectives a year and a half to have Lacey indicted. They did hundreds of hours of interviews with over 50 people. They went through every medical report, child services reports, social media, etc. with a fine-tooth comb, interviewing and re-interviewing witnesses over and over. Lacey played the victim, blamed the hospital and the doctors for Garnet's death, cried betrayal to her friends, and continued obsessively posting one disturbing lie-filled post after another, with pictures of Garnet in the hospital in obvious distress and dying. She tried to garner as much sympathy as possible, and she got more and more desperate as his sympathy went dry. The newspapers and television media latched onto her and didn't let go, and she was called the mummy blogger. On June 15, 2014, the grand jury indicted Lacey Spears for second-degree murder and first-degree manslaughter for her son. Lacey pleaded not guilty. She was arrested and taken into custody. Lacey was denied bail, and her arrest made the headlines all over the world. On Tuesday, February 3rd, 2015, Lacey's trial began, and the evidence was overwhelmingly against her. On Monday, March 2nd, Lacey Spears was found guilty of second-degree murder of Garnet Spears. Sentencing was set for April 8th. After the verdict, Lacey continued to proclaim her innocence, saying she was shocked that the jury found her guilty after all the evidence they heard at the trial. This is what she said, quote, I always thought I would be going home. I'm innocent. I never did anything to harm my son. In her interview for a pre-sentencing report, she blamed, she blamed negligent medical staff for Garnet's death. She also maintained that Valerie Plache had lied about the phone call to get rid of the feeding bag. Judge Neary then asked Lacey Spears if she had anything to say to the court before he passed the sentence. No, sir, she said. And this is what he said, quote, Miss Spears. In many respects, your crime is unfathomable in its cruelty. You give rise to many questions that I frankly don't have answers for. How can a mother ever treat her innocent son with such callous, inhumane, and calculating manner? Do you even realize the magnitude of your crime? Why didn't you speak up for help at some point? It was a series of planned and orchestrated actions that really shocked the conscience. Instead of nurturing and protecting a beautiful child, you subjected him to five years of torment and pain. Anyone that saw that video in the trial of the evidence of Garnet in the hospital, writhing in pain, unable to vomit, may never be able to erase those images from their mind. And you also accused dedicated doctors and nurses who tried to save your son's life. Nothing could be further from the truth. You attempted to portray the police and prosecutors as unethical and willing participants in an elaborate conspiracy to deny your justice. You brought shame and heartbreak to your family and friends, many of whom had written letters in court to support you. One does not have to be a psychiatrist to realize that you suffer from a mental illness known as Munchausen's by proxy. I hope you, over the next few years, come to terms with your condition and are receptive to any treatment that may be available to you. Then the judge asked whether something even remotely positive could emerge from this tragedy. And he said, my hope is that the publicity that Garnet's case has and will receive serves to put a spotlight on Munchausen's by proxy syndrome and that the public becomes more aware of that condition and people do not shy away from reporting suspected abusers who exhibit symptoms of this illness. He told her that the sentence he was about to impose was designed not only to punish her for her crime, but also to act as a deterrent to others. I am aware that you suffer from a mental illness. It's not one that affects your competency or your ability to stand trial or your ability to know right from wrong. 
and to appreciate the nature and the consequences of your act. But it is a mental illness all the same. He said he would show her mercy by not imposing the maximum sentence. Quote, I took the bench this morning, hoping you might say something that would enable me to show you some mercy, and I haven't heard it from you. I'm sad that you have not taken responsibility yet for your actions, and I haven't seen any genuine sign of remorse. Nonetheless, I'm going to sentence you to something less than the maximum. Based upon you having been found guilty after trial by jury of your peers for the crime of murder in the second degree, I sentence you to an indeterminate term in state prison with a minimum of 20 years and a maximum of life. Lacey Spears was then taken to the care and custody of the New York State Department of Corrections to begin serving her life sentence. So Lacey Spears has maintained her innocence over the years. She says life in prison has been horrible for her and that she is abused daily with haunts of baby killer and packages assault being dumped on her food. She feels that she has suffered great abuse at the hands of the justice system and that she will persevere and be exonerated and be set free one day. She resides in the Bedford Hills Correctional Facility in upstate New York, and she is eligible for parole in June 2030. And that's the end of this Lacey Spears case. I see where the judge was going with that, but uh, I wish that she had have got maxim, maximum. And I hope she doesn't see a day of free life in her life. And as long as she keeps denying it, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping they will never let her free. And hopefully it'll be past the time that she can have any other children. And hopefully she'll never be allowed to be around children ever again. But uh, this is just a horrible, horrible case. Munchausen's by proxy is a thing, a condition, an illness, what, whatever, a crime that I find that I just don't have any sympathy or empathy for. And I wonder, should I? Am I, am I being unfair? And I just can't. I can't elicit feelings of, of feeling any kind of empathy or sympathy for her. I don't feel bad for her. And I just wish her the worst. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, that's that's it. And uh, thank you for hanging in there for this episode. I know it, it took a while to, to, to get out there. And uh, before I end this, I want to thank you for these two great iTunes reviews from Just the Tip. <laughs> it's a great name. And uh, Amanda0590. Thank you, guys. I appreciate these reviews. It, uh, like I said before, it makes me very happy. And I appreciate all of you that listens to this podcast. And what's coming up in the future? Well, first of all, like I said, or earlier, I said that Eric and I have having a hard time getting together to record because life has just been so wild and crazy as I know it has for every one of you out there. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that's not going to come in the future. We will, when things settle down and get a little bit more you know, under control, we will start recording together again. Um, I'll let you know what, as that day gets sooner. I have some good things coming up and I will start posting shortly about what cases and what things I'll be covering. Thank you all for listening. Please stay safe out there. <laughs> Wear a mask, wash your hands, socially distance, please. And be kind to one another. Be kind to yourself. Let's try to love one another. And most importantly, love yourself. Peace. One love. True crime and it gets none realer. Sometimes it'll be the cure that'll kill you. Gotta watch out. Yeah, you gotta watch your back. Cause you don't want to be another episode on stat. Thank you for tuning in. Learn a thing or two. These medical mysteries can be unbelievable. Yeah. Subscribe. Make sure you do that. So you'll be tuned in and be ready for the next show. Stack. Stack.